Starting just after Finland's independence in 1917, we will be covering how important historical events shaped Finland's cinema in that era up to the present day. Finland struggled to unite its people after the Civil War. Film was used to represent an undivided, utopic nation to help Finnish people heal and homogenize the country. The films avoided political and societal conflicts to address a larger audience. Class conflicts were simply solved on a personal level. The Logger's Wife, a rural melodrama directed by Eric Karu in 1923, who was one of the most prominent figures in Finland's early cinematic history, represented and helped define concepts of national cinema at that time. This film is one of the first full-length Finnish films, and like most films of its era, the landscape played a key character and the plot is an adaptation of a novel. The story follows a family feud that takes place on the edge of dangerous rapids that ties into the drama. It follows an archetypal lumberjack and a strong female character, Hannah. The film was so popular that it played outside of Finland's borders and was remade in 1937 with sound. World War II was a very difficult time in Finland. They were involved in three separate conflicts that came with a heavy cost. These left deep wounds that would not be resolved for decades. Domestic films nearly entirely disappeared during Soviet occupation in these conflicts, but returned when the Finns pushed back in 1941, resorting back to the classics melodrama style of the 1920s and 30s that they were comfortable and familiar with. A notable example of this was in As You Like Me To Be, which was a straightforward syphilis film involving the story of a woman resorting to prostitution as her life and relationships fall apart around her. Fallout from the war was hard. The Finnish people were left with heavy casualties, a generation lost, and alienated by the West over their allegiance to Nazi Germany. People wanted answers and a way to mend. Edmund Leine did this with The Unknown Soldier in 1954. An adaptation of Vino Lina's novel of the same name, the movie aimed to accurately depict the war, produce a positive image of Finland internationally, and to help the Finnish people deal with the collective national trauma that was still very fresh. It went on to become the most famous and successful Finnish movie of all time. Film industry suffered setbacks from the war. Many cinemas were lost and tax on film went up, which crippled the industry. Pessimistic, dark films appeared to imitate the mood of the people, but they took more fondly to the lighter ballads and melodramas from before as an escape. They remained prominent into the 1950s. Tired of the same genre for so long by the late 50s, Finns began to turn to American film. This and an actor's union strike leading to raised production cost caused a prolonged downturn in Finnish cinema. The Finnish government tried stimulating growth by offering tax benefits to more explorative films. By the 1960s, there were films inspired by French New Wave and Italian neorealism, such as in The Diary of a Worker in 1967. Finnish cinema still had no central state-funded body and was susceptible to the fast-changing financial times. The inception of the Film Foundation in 1969 and nationalism of the Film Archive in 1974 provided some stability even through the financially devastating 90s. A notable film from this rebirth was Risto Yarva's The Year of the Hare, which asked the Finnish question about meaning and purpose. The film is about a civil servant who, tired of the meaninglessness of his existence, leaves his job and home to find freedom and peace. Aki Karasmaki's work this trilogy, Shadows in Paradise, Ariel, and The Match Factory Girl, begin with scenes of work, and Karasmaki's unique style focuses on the details of the individual life and destiny of the main characters accurately representing Finland in the 80s. In this era, Finland had a casino economy, deregulated banks were distributing cheap loans making credit more available, and the industrial sector was becoming less and less important. It was a time of managed reconstructing, which was a boom for the well-off, but a time of uncertainty for the less fortunate. Karasmaki's Ariel follows the main character Taisto, who leaves the decaying mining industry and teams up with Ermeli and her son. This economic transformation is represented by the mise en scène and contrast of Taisto's and Ermeli's homes. Taisto's home depicts a time that was dependent on the mining industry, a culture, class, and time that has come and gone. The suicide of Taisto's father in the first few scenes shows the uncertainty and fear of those stuck in this time and symbolizes the end of this era. In contrast, Ermeli's apartment in Helsinki is filled with new furniture and represents the rapid economic growth and lifestyle obtainable from accessible credit. In 1991, the breakdown of the Soviet Union caused about 20% of Finland's foreign trade to evaporate. Their market was devalued, their market forces were released, and so much more. All of these factors and many others resulted in Finland's economic depression and rise of unemployment in the 90s. 
Aki Karzmaki's Drifting Clouds, released in 1996, reflected the current reality of the Depression at this time, from the perspective of ordinary working-class people. The film is an extension of the Workers' Trilogy's themes. Ilona, a waitress, works at a restaurant, and as her restaurant continues to lose more customers, she ultimately loses her job. And her husband, Lori, a streetcar driver, becomes unemployed when cuts are made and he draws a low card in a game of chance. They struggle to find sustainable employment in a jobless time. At the end of the film, they ultimately establish a restaurant called Work, whose future is hopeful but uncertain. Emphasized by Karas Maki's minimalistic and lingering shots, the film reflects the conditions of society and even the optimistic ending is still tainted by the harsh reality as the couple struggles to keep their dignity and solidarity in the 90s. Finnish film attendance increased by 1 million visits in 1999, marking the start of the Finnish film boom. Seven films were released during the heart of this time, and five were set in the past, and not a single film was set in an urban setting. The Finnish audience was very interested in historic films as they acted as a distraction from the hardships and issues of the present, such as the depression of the 90s and globalization. Looking more into globalization, these films help the audience remember and reflect on the past and locations that they have not personally experienced, but play significant roles in their national identity. Sibelius, released in 2003, helped the nation remember their heritage. It follows the conventional storylines, historic national symbols, and cinematic devices of the genre. The film begins with footage from Sibelius' funeral in 1957. By beginning the film with this nationwide event, it reminds the audience of the impact of Sibelius' compositions on their independence. At the conclusion of the film boom, Finland's domestic film market had become far more established. With more resources and attention on Finnish domestic film than before, Finland moved for nostalgic reflection and began looking to imitate other styles from abroad. Hollywood had been a historically present figure in the Finnish film market for decades. After the boom, the industry was more comfortable and able to support Finnish takes on Hollywood style. This began to become popularized predominantly with Domi Karakoski. Beauty and the Bastard was a very standard, cliché Hollywood representation of the Romeo and Juliet love story of lovers from opposite worlds fighting the odds to be together. This movie used classic Hollywood tropes and even American R&B and hip-hop music to provide a very faithful Finnish depiction of a Hollywood movie. This was repeated in Lapland Odyssey in 2010, a clear example of a road movie, a historically American subgenre that draws roots from old westerns, in which characters face existential compulsion to try to find out who they are. Lapland Odyssey uses the lonely, desolate setting well to emphasize the search of self and add gravity to their stories and their goals. Historically, Finnish directors have used cinema to address issues prevalent to Finland at the time. Aki Karismaki used his films as critique for socialism and economic instability. Edvin Leine used The Unknown Soldier to help the nation heal from World War II. Nowadays, it's no different. Dome Karakoski tackled the taboo but important issue of racial hate groups with Heart of a Lion, showing the brutality and futility of hatred in a transformative film very similar to American History X, released 15 years prior. Aki Karazmaki has focused his attempts on evaluating the refugee crisis in his movies, The Habre and The Other Side of Hope. With the larger impact of Finnish domestic cinema still remaining from the boom, the industry has become more comfortable using films as a platform for expressing political views and trying to incorporate global filming techniques into Finnish culture as a way to ease the people into this new and quickly changing world instead of retreating to a nostalgic past. Twenty seventeen not only marks a fantastic opportunity to celebrate Finland's independence, but also a time to reflect on the country's development and culture. Finnish national cinema has changed over the years and been impacted by historical events and used as a method of expression. It is a remarkable feat that Finland has endured through the economic and social turbulence of the last century, and we're looking forward to seeing where their cinema goes next.